السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ما بعد إن شاء الله today we're going to be looking at a short lesson from Surah Ali Imran from our verses for today verse 133 through 135 uh, or rather 136 these were verses that were the favorite of Mawlana Islahi he used to remind us every year he would always explain this passage and I thought although we we have heard this a lot it'd be a good reminder for myself and all of us here to look at the characteristics of the people of Jannah in these verses. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَعِدَّةِ الْمُتَّقِينَ It's a beautiful passage, very inspiring, very eloquent. And Allah teaches us so much in these three or four verses. So He says in the beginning, وَسَارِعُوا Race, rush. Sari'u in Arabic means to race. When you're lining up children or even adults and you're on a race and you have a goal. So Allah uses the example or the image of a race, of a competition, a physical race, where people are going in a direction and there's an ultimate goal, the finish line. So Allah says race to what? What is the finish line? Maghfirati min rabbikum, forgiveness of your Lord, and a jannah, a paradise, whose width is as wide as the heavens and the earth. So this is a motivational verse, a verse that's meant to inspire, to give us hope and to give us the end goal, to give us an idea of what our life is. Our life is a race. Our life is a competition. Um, look at what day of Ramadan it is today, three or four, three, the third day or the fourth tarawih. You know, almost a week is over. Our whole lives are like that. We are in a race. Time is going so fast. It's not stopping for anyone. So Allah is reminding you're all in a race. But the end goal and the end result should be, your target should be the forgiveness from Allah. And this paradise that's so wide, is wider than the heavens and the earth. Uiddat lil muttaqin. It is prepared for the people of taqwa, muttaqin. So this is something common from the first lesson. The beginning of the Qur'an, Allah told us that this Qur'an is guidance. And who is the guidance for? Hudan lil muttaqin. Guidance for the people of taqwa. So Allah shared some characteristics there. And He's sharing characteristics here. And they're actually very consistent. Everything in the Qur'an is consistent. And it's just Allah is emphasizing different aspects of these uh, qualities and characteristics. So... When you see a verse, when you hear a verse like that, or you read a verse like that, Allah is inspiring you and He tells you this end goal, this beautiful goal. And Allah give us, all of us here, and all of the people we know, this end result. He says in the following verses, what are the qualities? And He shares basically there are three qualities here. You can summarize them, there are three qualities. Number one, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ those who spend in fact they spend in the way of Allah in prosperity and in adversity. These are people who spend. Spending, we all know what spending is. You sacrifice something that you have. Generally it's applied to finance, to money. So you spend some money in the path of Allah. Now, when it comes to infaq in the Quran, remember the danger we talked about with Imam al-Ghazali. One of the dangers people have is they make the Qur'an remote from you, yourself. You know, so in Faq, when you read a verse of in Faq, and you are, let's say, a college student, and you're living in your parents' house, and you don't have a job. So you'll read these verses and you'll think, well, this is not for me. So you might just pass these verses and not reflect over them. But when it comes to in Faq, it's very interesting in the Qur'an, Infaq or spending is for everyone. In the beginning, the opening of the Quran, what did Allah say about Hudalil Muttaqin? Who are the people of Taqwa? Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb wa yuqimuna salah wa mimma razaqunahum yunfiqun. This is the characteristic number three. They believe in the unseen, they establish prayers, 
And number three, they spend from what we have given them. This quality is so important, it's for everyone. The beginning of the Quran is not for a specific group of people. That's for every single person. So these are the most essential qualities Allah begins the Quran with, reminding us who we need to be. So that means infaq is for everyone. That's the message that Allah gives us in the Quran. Every time you mention yuqimuna salah, what does he follow up with? Wa zakah. So that means zakat is not just for the wealthy, or infaq is not just for the wealthy, it's for everyone. And in this verse, Allah brings a different angle. He says, those who spend when they have money and when they don't have blessings. Fisarra'i wa darra. So you might think to yourself, okay, how do you spend when you don't have? So this is shaitan coming to you, you don't have enough money or you don't have blessings. But if you, if you think about it a different way and you, and, you, and you see that infaq is so important in the life of a believer, in the journey of our faith, we have five pillars of practice, right? In Islamic practice, shahada, salah, and then zakat. So this is, these five pillars are basically a journey for every human being. All of us have to go through these. These pillars are like revolving doors. So in Dara, you might be asking, okay, how do we spend when we don't have? So there are many, many ways. This kind of thinking is limited. You have to be creative and you have to think that you know, if you don't have one thing, you might have some other things that you can exert in the way of Allah. And here I'll share with you a hadith, um, Imam al-Bukhari shares a hadith, where um, the Prophet sallallahu one day he said, ala kulli muslim sadaqa. That same theme, the theme we're sharing with you is spending in is for everyone. So one day the Messenger of Allah, he said just that, ala kulli muslim sadaqa. Every single Muslim is enjoined to spend in the way of Allah. So people came to him and they said to the Messenger of Allah, um, Ya Rasulullah, Ara'ayta in lam ajid. What if I don't have anything to spend? So that question arose even for the companions. What if we don't have something to spend? And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? Just think about what response he would have given. You know, he could have said, just make this beer or something like that. But he gave a series of steps. And this is very, very important to look at how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prioritized things. So he said to him, Ya'mal uh, nafsahu wa He said, do something with your hands so you can earn something to help yourself and then you can spend in the way of Allah. So that first step, someone who doesn't have money, you don't just, you know, the Prophet didn't just say, okay, just do this, sit in the masjid or, or you know, make the dhikr or tasbih. That's also one of the steps. But the first thing he said, you have hands. Go out and do something with your hands. Earn something, benefit yourself and then benefit others. And then the companions asked, what if someone can't do that? There are people who are not able to do that. They might be handicapped. They might have physical ailments. Or there might be other circumstances preventing them from earning and using their hands to earn something. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, He said, then you should go and help someone in need. Okay, if you can't spend in the way of Allah, at least you can go and help somebody. There's so many ways of helping people in need. There are always people in society that are in need. Helping someone with uh, their groceries, helping someone with transportation. You can, the, the sky is the limit. So the, the step number three was go out and help someone. What was the Prophet doing? He was inspiring people that in fact is for everyone. His message was, ala kulli muslim sadaqa. Upon every Muslim is sadaqa. So step number one, spend in the way of Allah. If you can't, go out and earn something and spend in the way of Allah. And if you can't, then go out and help someone. That's still sadaqah. You're going out and helping the need. There's so many ways here in America. You have the food pantry here in MCMC. We have Ikna Relief down the block. They're doing so much work. You have helping hands. You have you know, so many relief organizations. Anyway, the companions, they said, what if we can't do that? Qalu fa illam yajid. What if we cannot do that as well? So then he said, فَلْيَعْمَلْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ So go out and do something good. Every one of you can do something good. Just general, ma'roof. Doing something good. Um, 
And then the companions, they asked one more time, what if we can't do that? You know, who, who knows who this questioner, we don't know the, the, the questioner, we don't know the full context. It is a sound hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. And then the final step, when the companions asked, well, what if we can't do that? Even we can't do something good, which is hard to imagine. But there'd be a scenario we can't find something good to do. So the last thing the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَالْيُمْسِكْ عَنِ الشَّرْفَ إِنَّهَا لَهُ صَدَقَ Then at least, the least thing you can do is keep your evil away from people. Don't harm other people. Keep your potential evil and harm from other people and that will be your sadaqah. So this is the message of Allah in the Quran and the Prophet Sallallahu that, you know, in fact, all these characteristics for everyone. So, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ That's number one. Number two, those who suppress their anger, they restrain their anger. As uh, Molna used to say, like those who uh, those who swallow their anger, that's the terminology in the tafsir. One of the ways the scholars describe it, those who just swallow their anger. So this life is meant to be difficult. You're going to encounter various people you are going to get angry. That's a natural human emotion. Even the Prophet on occasion became angry. The point is never not to never get angry, but to know how to deal with it. So al min al ghayd is an important characteristic. Those who when their anger naturally arises, they might be offended or harmed by somebody, which will happen in most people's lives, jazakallah khair. Um, when that situation arises, you just swallow it. And then, وَلَعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ Now, many people understand this as a separate characteristic. But actually, these, the next three characters are one and the same. Because swallowing anger, if you just look at it by itself, it might not be very healthy. right? Because when people are angry all the time and they swallow it and they keep it inside, you know what happens. What's the end result? You know, the blood pressure rises, stress, all these diseases come. So many diseases uh, we see as 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 medical practitioners, there is uh, the cause is, you know, either anger. The person's angry a lot. It leads to heart attacks, cardiovascular disease, so many issues. Or there's a lot of stress that's very similar to anger. So psychologists, people who are involved in therapy, they don't advise to just keep the anger inside. You have to find ways of, you know, an outlet. You have to find some ways. So. If you read this verse together and you see that's a natural progression. It's the same characteristic. They swallow their anger and then they forgive others. So that's a higher step. You're going above and beyond. Not only are you just suppressing that insult, you're swallowing it, but going beyond that to forgive others. Forgive the people who wronged you. That's a higher step. It's not easy. It's very, very difficult. But this is, you know, um, you know, this is what gets you Jannah. These things are not going to be easy. So the second step is uh, after anger, you swallow, you, you restrain yourself. You also forgive people. And in therapy, that's one of the things they teach you. One of the most profound uh, outcomes in therapy, they tell you to forgive people who wronged you. And that's something once you actually forgive, not just by mouth, but actually forgive, then that's where you can heal inside. And the anger goes away and then you can move on. But those who are stuck in the past, stuck with the insult and the harm and the injury, they can't move on and it's not healthy. So anger is very, very important to swallow this anger. We know that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, someone came to him and he, they said to him, give us some advice. It's a famous hadith. It's in uh, Bukhari and Muslim and uh, it's in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muwatta of Imam Malik rather. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Alimni uh, bi kalimatin or kalimatin a'ishu bihinna. O Messenger of Allah, teach me some words I can live by. But wala tukfir alayya fa'ansa. But don't give me a lot that I will forget. So just give me something simple I can live by and not too much that I will forget. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, La taghdab. Do not get angry. Fight your anger. Try not to get angry. And then that person asked again, and the Prophet gave the same advice. So three times he asked, and the same advice, la taghdab. So this is very, very important. It's very hard to control one's anger. 
That's why there's uh, the Prophet Sallallahu also said in the sound hadith, Laysa shadidu bi sura. The strong man is not the one who wrestles another to the ground. Very famous hadith. This is one of the strongest hadith we have on record. Hadith that's in Bukhari, Muslim, and the Muwatta of Imam Malik. These three are the soundest books of hadith in our tradition. When you find a hadith that's in all three, that's one of the strongest uh, you know, hadith there is. And this hadith has a golden isnad. So it comes from uh, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. So first it comes from Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira related this to his son-in-law, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, who married the daughter of Abu Huraira. And Sa'id ibn Musayyib related this to Zuhri. And Zuhri related to Imam Malik. Zuhri was Imam Malik's teacher. And from Imam Malik, it came to others like Bukhari. So this is a hadith. لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِسُرْعَةً فَإِنَّمَا الشَّدِيدُ الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الغضب. The strong man or woman is not the one who can wrestle another to the ground, but the strong one who can restrain himself or herself at the time of anger. So this is very, very hard. But it's restraining or anger and then forgiving others. Then Allah says, Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. Now this is the third step in the same characteristic. Ihsan. And Allah reminds, Allah loves the muhsineen. Ihsan is when you treat, it's, it's something much more general. So first it's specific and Allah is getting more general. Specific is restraining your anger. Then you get more general where you forgive others. And then you even more general, you treat people with ihsan, with kindness, with excellence. Ihsan is going above and beyond. So justice, if you can say adli wal ihsan, inna, inna, uh, inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Allah commands adl, which is justice, and ihsan. Ihsan is more than justice. Justice is to give people what they deserve. But ihsan is to give people more than they deserve. Give them people better than they deserve. This is a beautiful characteristic. We'll talk about this on another time, ihsan. But this is characteristic number two. So swallowing the anger, forgiving others, treating people with ihsan. And finally, number three, those who when they commit a sin, a fahisha, um, or they wrong themselves. ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهِ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ They remember Allah immediately and they seek Allah's forgiveness and then Allah interjects وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُوا ذُنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Who is there that can forgive you except Allah? And then, then he says إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُصِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ And they don't persist on what they're doing while knowingly. So this is an important characteristic because Allah knows that human beings are going to sin. We all make mistakes. But the people of paradise are not the people who never made mistakes. People of paradise who when they make mistakes, when they wrong themselves, they immediately, they still, their hearts are alive. They immediately remember Allah. So even in this time when they, when they do something wrong, very soon later, very soon after, thereafter, their hearts come alive and then they seek Allah's forgiveness and then resolve not to persist in that sin. This is called Israr, persisting in that sin. So it's not just someone who just says Astaghfirullah like in a superficial way, but it's very, very important. And then Allah says at the end, so these are the people whose reward is forgiveness from Allah in gardens underneath which rivers flow and they will be living therein forever. What a great reward. Ni'ma ajr ala amilin for the people who work. So these are characteristics, very, very important, essential characteristics for this great prize. Forgiveness from Allah and paradise. This expansive paradise and underneath which rivers flow. And Allah in this whole passage is inspiring us. Reminding us who's the forgiving one. Reminding us. So there are two quick lessons from the beginning and end I wanted to share. Um, the first word is sari or race. And when you see in the Quran, whenever Allah mentions the hereafter, uh, generally the language Allah uses is to rush, to hurry up, to race. So you have sari uh, race be to the forgiveness of your Lord. Fastabiqul khairat. Allah says, uh, excel with one another, race with one another for the khairat, doing good deeds. Um, in another place, have a competition. Sabiqu is, is similar to sari or 
Sariru means to rush, Sabiqu means to race. Um, and then the Prophet also, Badiru bil a'mal, he would say, hurry up and do good deeds before your death comes, before a time comes, you won't be able to do it. So whenever it comes to Jannah, paradise, hereafter, the language Allah uses is his language of rushing because you have to feel the urgency of it. Time is passing very, very fast. And when it comes to good deeds, Allah wants us to rush. Allah wants us to race. Let the people who race, race with one another. When you contrast this with this world and worldly blessings, there are verses where Allah says you are allowed to partake in the blessings of this life. You can enjoy this life to some extent. So in Surah Al-Mulk, Allah says, Allah says, He made this earth, this worldly life, subjected to you. And He wants to teach us that it's allowed to enjoy your life to some extent in this world. But what does He say? What language does He use? And you want, I want you to compare that language with Sariru. So when He speaks about the earth, Allah says, Allah says, walk in the paths of the earth. وَكُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِهِ And eat from the provisions of the earth. وَإِلَيْهِ النُّشُورِ And even there, remember, you're going to come back to Allah. So it's very interesting. Here is run, and there is walk. So see the contrast? These are the insights you get when you reflect over Quran. When it comes to Akhirah, it's always run, rush, and all different types of synonyms that come from that. When it comes to eating and drinking and enjoying worldly blessings, the command is to walk. And that's a subtle lesson there. And finally, the last thing Allah says, Ni'ma ajrul amilin. Allah does not say at the end, it's very insightful uh, when you think about it. Allah does not say, uh, this is the reward of the people of Jannah. What a great reward for the people of Taqwa. What a great reward for Mu'mineen or Muslimin. He says, ajrul amilin. A great reward for the people who work. Amil workers. Great reward for workers. So the lesson there is that all of these characteristics, the, the common denominator there is they require work. They're very difficult. It's not just simply repentance from sin. It's not just simply spending in the way of Allah. So the first one, spending, it's not just spending, but spending when you have and when you don't have. That's what's difficult. So it's going above and beyond just spending. So the first character is you spend when you have wealth. Everyone spends when they have wealth. Well, maybe not everyone. There are people that are stingy, but it's easy to spend when you have a lot of money. But it's not easy to spend when you're in college or you're poor or you're destitute. There, the small amount that you spend has much more value than the thousands you will spend later when you have wealth. So this is, the, the, the you know, it's not easy. It's not just spending, but going above and beyond. And secondly, anger, look at the verse. It's not just not getting angry, but going above and beyond Suppressing your anger to forgiving the one who makes you angry. And above and beyond to treat him with ihsan or her with ihsan. And finally with the, with the sins, when we fall into sins, it's not just saying astaghfirullah, but it's remembering Allah, then seeking his forgiveness. And then not doing israr. Israr means you make a resolve not to do that again. So it's not just simple sin, oh let me do this and let me repent afterwards. That's not what it is. Lam yusirru ala ma fa'alu wa hum ya'lamun. Those who will not persist in it. There's a good explanation that I really liked from one of the salaf. And I'll share with you and that will be my last thing. Sahal ibn Abdullah, uh, rahimahullah, he said, when he's talking about different people who sin. There are different types of people that sin. And he gave a metaphor and it's very interesting and insightful. He said, al-jahil mayyit. So he said, some people sin out of ignorance. So people who do that, they're like dead. The jahil person is, he's dead. He's mayyit. Because he doesn't know. He doesn't even know that he doesn't know. And, you know, he won't change his circumstance because he's ignorant. And then when nasi, the second type of person that sins, is the one who does out of forgetfulness. He doesn't do it deliberately. So he says, when nasi na'im. So the jahil is, is the one who's dead. is like the one who's dead. The one who does it out of forgetfulness is like the one who's sleeping. Naim. And then Wala'asi, the one who does it deliberately out of disobedience to Allah, um, Sakran. He's like the drunk person. And because he's not, he doesn't know what he's doing. If he really knows what, what he was doing, he would never do that. He really knows the consequences 
And that applies to believers, even believers. So it is a good metaphor because someone who's drunk, he's temporarily overtaken. His senses are temporarily overtaken. And it doesn't last that long. When they, that person comes to their senses, then they realize what they did. And that's where they remember Allah. And finally, wal musir, the last stage, is the one who keeps doing what he does. Halik, he said, the one who persists in his sins is destroyed. That person is destroyed because the, the Musir is the one who keeps sinning. And even he might have repentance in there, but it's superficial. He'll say, well, I'll repent tomorrow. And right now, let me do what I'm doing and I'll repent tomorrow. That tomorrow will never come or might never come. So that's a very, very dangerous thing. That's why he said, well, Musir Halik. May Allah give us tawfiq to have these characteristics. May Allah bless all of us. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. No questions from Maz today. Alhamdulillah, that's a good day. <laughs>